So thank you so much for having me. Uh, I am Vice President of Discipline Agile for the Project Management Institute, and I'm one of the creators of the Discipline Agile Toolkit with Scott Ambler. Again, I'm in Calgary, Canada. I'm about, uh, if you don't know Cal or, uh, Canadian geography, I'm about the North, the, uh, the Rocky Mountains around Northwest, or North South, sorry, on the Western side of Canada. And Calgary is about one hour drive east of the mountains. So we can see the mountains from where I live. It's a beautiful place to live. Anyway, I'm gonna take you into uh, the world of Disciplined Agile and tell you what it's all about. I'll talk about what is Disciplined Agile, how can it help us, uh, an aspect of Disciplined Agile is Disciplined Agile delivery, and I'll explain what Disciplined Agile delivery is and take a deeper dive into that. I'll also talk about producing business value. And moving forward, I'll give you some insight as to where we plan to take Disciplined Agile in the future. So first of all, what is Disciplined Agile and where did it come from? Uh, in 2009, I'm just getting this out of the way. 2009, Scott Ambler was the chief uh, methodologist for Agile and Lean for IBM worldwide. And incidentally, Scott lives also in Canada, but um, about a four hour flight east of me in Toronto. And, and, but we've known each other for, we had known each other already for many years. And uh, while he was at IBM in charge of Agile and Lean, Scott realized that we needed something better than Scrum. Or, or richer than Scrum. Scrum is amazing, but we need to recognize that it's described by a, a very short Scrum guide, a small body of knowledge. I understand the brand new Scrum guide is something like 13 pages long. So there's not a lot of content there. What is in Scrum is amazing. You know, it is, it is gold, but it's still very little advice. And that is by design. I mean, Scrum never tried to tell us how to do testing and different ways of doing requirements and different techniques for estimating, et cetera. They created a kernel of process for us and then we are expected to figure out the rest of it ourselves. Unfortunately, organizations have, have had difficulty over the years figuring it out for themselves. And as a result, you have many different flavors of Agile, many different approaches, often conflicting approaches, uh, gaps in guidance, contradictory guidance, and uh, this is why Agile, in, in my, my mind, has developed a, a bad reputation in some places because it's um, the interpretation of it and the application of it has been inconsistent and not been done um, properly. And so we've lacked the guidance. So Scott, in, in, back in 2009, 2010, said we need something more enterprise strength. And that's where he came up with the idea of discipline Agile delivery and asked for me to participate in helping him to evolve it. And uh, so that's how it all got started. In 2012, we came out with our first book on disciplined agile delivery. And uh, if you've seen it, it's got a sailboat on the front of it. Uh, and that's how it all got started. And then in 2014, we expanded the scope of disciplined agile delivery, which is about creating high performance teams. I'll tell you more about that shortly. We expanded the scope to disciplined agile DevOps. And what that means is that if, if Discipline Agile Delivery teaches us how to create value, um, build features, create high performance teams, um, if we can deliver features every day, what good is it if we actually deploy them once a quarter? That's not really Agile. So this is where we need DevOps. This is where we need to layer in security, data, release management, support, operations, layer that into your delivery capability. And that is our view of enterprise DevOps. So came up with some ideas in 2014 on that. Expanded the scope further to all of IT. They're starting to think now about PMOs and product management and program management and portfolio management, uh, other ideas within IT. And then in 2017, expanded it, the scope of DA to the entire enterprise. And now we're starting to talk about functional areas like agile marketing and finance. Um, Etc. enterprise architecture. I'm gonna show you more about this shortly. And in 2019, last August, PMI acquired us, acquired our little Canadian company and Disciplined Agile. And I can tell you that Scott, speaking for Scott and, and myself, we are absolutely thrilled to be part of PMI. For us, I, I, I like to say it's a marriage made in heaven. Uh, PMI has been known as the best in class project management guidance, uh, a credible certification program. 
and and not for profit. And here we are in disciplined agile. We have always promoted an agnostic, pragmatic, um, context-based approach to agile. So that the agnosticism of disciplined agile, we work with any kind of method, fits beautifully into PMI. And now PMI um, has the best in both. You've you got your standard classic project management and its guidance, and you've got uh, disciplined agile, that uh, world-class guidance in how to implement using agile approaches. And by the way, there is a hybrid between the two. You can absolutely use um, both, both approaches. So in, shortly after we were acquired last year, we also, PMI also acquired uh, n uh, from Net Objectives, um, Net Objectives and Al Shalloway, the thought leader behind something called Flex. And Flex, the FL in Flex stands for flow. Al used to be um, a trainer of SAFE. He, I believe he was the first SAFE gold partner. Uh, so he knows SAFE very well. And yet he discovered that some, many organizations are struggling with agile at scale, which is what SAFE is for. And, and so Al has the, these, these theories about improving flow within large scale agile implementations. If you've got a one or 200 developers building something using SAFE, you can use Flex to find out where the bottlenecks are and improve flow so that you can deliver more frequently. With less risk. So we, we are in the process right now of integrating the flex content with the disciplined agile content and I will um, show you a little bit of that today. So what is it, DA? DA is a toolkit that provides straightforward guidance that enables us to make better decisions inside our organization about our way of working, our ways of working. We used to call disciplined agile a process decision framework. Uh, that's what we used to call it. We've moved to, to to calling it a toolkit. The reason we, it is, it does provide us guidance for how to make better decisions. If we want to supplement our user stories of requirements with some other requirements model, we need to make decisions. And we've created a framework collection of practices to help you find ways to get better at doing requirements modeling, albeit in an agile way, beyond agile stories. But the thing is that people, when we, when we called ourselves a framework, people confused us with other frameworks like SAFE, methods like Scrum, and, we are, and we're not the same. We're, we're, not a, we're not a method. We're a collection of practices. So it's not us competing with SAFE. We can help SAFE get better. We can help Scrum get better. So it's, I think a better analogy is a cupboard full of ingredients, um, and Scrum might be a recipe that uses very few ingredients. SAFE uses more ingredients, it's, it's a bigger thing. Um, those ingredients are what is in the DA toolkit. So think of it as a collection of practices. And we, we, we have found that the word toolkit, people understand more about what, what it is. And I will show you uh, examples of the content. So hopefully that will, that will help. This, so you see Scott, myself and Al Shalloway, and the idea here is that there are literally hundreds of pra agile practices out there. And it, it's hard for, for us as practitioners to understand them all. And you know, you've got all these thought leaders out there and each of them are, have a, a, their particular um, view on what agile is. And usually it's a piece of the life cycle. For instance, Dave Snowden specializes on complexity theory, something called Kinefin. Uh, Jurgen Apello specializes on modern agile management. It's one of the things he, he talks about. Um, and you know, extreme programming talks about technical practices. It, it talks about a lot more than that, but that's where a lot of people go to extreme programming or XP to supplement their agile with the technical practices from that. So all these methods are great but they typically focus on a particular area. So for us to have the coverage to understand end-to-end -end delivery, it's like we have to have a dozen certifications, we need to read, read dozens of books, <laughs> and typically these certifications are, are, these certifications or books are, are driven by one or two thought leaders. So I always ask myself, what happens when they retire? So what's gonna happen to their material? Well, this is one of the great things about us now being part of PMI is that it's not about Mark and Scott and Al anymore. It's about PMI and PMI will continue to evolve DA over time. 
And, and to my previous points about needing 12 different certifications to understand the complete picture, we have done that work for you. We have read the 100 books and we've pulled the practices into one cohesive, comprehensive, well-organized body of knowledge. Uh, and, and so that Sunil, our, our CEO, likes to think of DA as an umbrella over all of Agile. You know, methods come and go. I, I used to teach something called the Rational Unified Process. I used to work for a company called Rational Software. We were bought by IBM. I used to teach, quote unquote, best practices around agile project management and requirements management and testing and architecture, and object oriented analysis and design and things. And, and I taught this thing called the Rational Unified Process or RUP. And nobody talks about RUP anymore. It's, it had its time, it was really popular in its day, but people have moved on and there were some good things about RUP and there were things, some things, frank, quite frankly, that weren't so agile. But what we've done is we pull out the good parts of RUP and we put it into the DA toolkit. And we pull out the good parts of Scrum and the good parts of DA, and that's what you end up with. An umbrella over agile. Methods will come and go over the years, but the underlying practices, if you invest in learning the practices, you will become much more effective than trying to keep up with all the methods. All right, so let's talk a little bit about at the highest level, the mindset. We build on the Agile mindset. We build on the Agile manifesto, and we've taken the ideas and, and consolidated them into principles, promises, and guidelines. And I'm not gonna talk about them all. We don't have time, but I'm gonna highlight some of the ones that are really, um, near to me and, and dear to me. And, and the first one of the principles is to delight customers. I mean, why, do, why are we doing this? We're, we want to delight the customers. We want to add value. And related to delighting the customers is being awesome. And, and it's kind of a corny phrase, be awesome, but it's because it's we're very passionate about this. I've been doing Agile for over 25 years before even it was called Agile. And I've been very fortunate to see uh, teams who quite frankly haven't been very happy in the past using traditional approaches, um, sort of very command and control, control project management, seeing them discover agile, being given the freedom to customize their way of working within, within some guidance. And this is the discipline and disciplined agile. We, we, won't, we need to have some guardrails around the way we work because we're working in the enterprise, but the freedom to optimize your way of working and to focus on the value add activities versus the things that don't add value or perhaps create waste. Um, this creates joy. This, this creates awesome teams and awesome teams um, create happy business stakeholders. And those stakeholders provide praise back to the teams. And that becomes a virtuous uh, feedback cycle, if you will. And the awesomeness improves <laughs> and, and the ability to deliver on time, on budget, um, delighting the stakeholders, minimizing the risks is what this is all about. So, so awesomeness is really important and it's related to joy. We'll talk a bit about joy in a second. And then context counts. The DA recognizes that the way you do agile in one project could be completely different than another project, even within the same organization. Any large organization is going to have a variety of different types of work uh, or small organization, by the way, it doesn't have to be large. So you have a variety of different kinds of projects and, and therefore requiring a variety of different kinds of approaches. For instance, if you're building a simple website where the risk, the worst thing that can happen is a page doesn't display properly or is not found or something. Well, that is not a huge risk to the business and it's easy to fix. So you could probably take a, a very agile approach as a team building your websites. But if you're building software for medical devices, or ventilators or something like that. Well, then people could die if there's bugs in the software. So your approach to agile is gonna be much more rigorous than the previous example. And so it really is important that we understand how to customize a flavor of agile that makes sense for our situation. So context does count. There's no one way to do agile. Um, agile, a lot of agile thought leaders try to make things black and white. This is the way you do it. You don't do it this way. And folks, the world isn't black and white. It's gray, many shades of gray. And we need to think and decide which approach we take for a given situation. So context counts and we are pragmatic. We, you know, some people say no agile team should be more, more than nine people. That's silly. <laughs> I've worked with teams of dozens of people and had no problem whatsoever. 
So we need to think about this and, and don't get locked into the way one agile method tells you you must do things. We need to be pragmatic. And that relates to choice is good. We have, rather than saying, you know, Scrum is the only way to go, we no, we recognize in some situations a lean approach is a better approach. In fact, some some situations, Scrum is an incredibly bad idea. So if everything you know is based around Scrum, then you're going to be ineffective in some situations. Now we have new certifications that are built around Scrum, Scrum Master. I'm going to tell you at the more about them at the end here. But that's just the name of the cert. Underneath it, it's far more than Scrum. You can do Scrum, you can do Lean, you can do uh, a blend of the two. You can do what we call an exploratory approach because choice is good. And it's really nice within the DA toolkit to pick a, an approach or what we call a life cycle that makes sense for you. Uh, so I'm gonna move on into promises now and pick out a couple of the ones that, that I really like. Create psychological safety and embrace diversity. Diversity makes our teams stronger. Um, I'm always looking to increase diversity, diversity of approach, diversity of everything. Um, otherwise, we kind of get into sort of a, a myopic mindset in many cases, and we ignore um, the opportunities that we have. And psychological safety gives us permissions to fail once in a while, as long as we learn without being judged accordingly. Uh, so safety is really important in teams. We do things, we, we promise to accelerate value realization, make all work visible. This is classic agile. You may have heard of a phrase, no hidden work. So if you're using a Kanban board, a task board, whether that's a virtual board or a face-to-face, -face, like right next to me, I have a here a personal Kanban board to track my work, not done, in progress, complete. So make your work visible, uh, improve continuously. Some guidelines. Uh, I'll pick uh, number the fourth one here. Correct, create effective environments that foster joy. Um, and this goes back to the being awesome. Right, create an environment. And this this is about what modern management is about. Creating an environment that fosters joy and productivity for your teams. And um, you know, people don't try and change the people. People are good. Change the system. We often see this that great people are stuck in a bad system. Um, so this is how you improve your culture. Don't focus on the people so much as changing the system. Um, create self uh, semi-autonomous self-organizing teams means. Self-organizing teams means the team is free to improve the processes and customize their way of working. But we say semi-autonomous because the enterprise um, awareness and DI recognizes that we do work within an enterprise and you're probably gonna have a collection of teams. There are, so there are certain consistencies you want to cross those teams. So giving them the freedom, but within you know appropriate guidelines. And I'm gonna move on to uh, the scope of disciplined agile. So recently we've kind of refactored the content and we have a foundational layer and I've just talked through the principles, promises and guidelines. There's also basic agile mindset kind of things like in the agile approach or scrum based approach versus a lean approach. Even some traditional serial ideas may make sense for you in some situations. So choice is good and we're prag pragmatic and then we talk about roles and teams and ways of working. Building on that foundation. I'm building out what we call a square onion in DA. It has layers. And at the delivery layer, you've got these, um, th these things. One, one is called discipline agile delivery. The hexes, by the way, these are called process blades. Just think of them as the way we organize the content. It, this is not structural. This is not an organize, organizational design. It's very merely how we organize the content. Okay. So don't, don't misinterpret this as, as structural design. Um, so this one DevOps says, we've well, got the, the, the delivery aspect. So this is combining Scrum and extreme programming and agile modeling, agile data, all these great practices from the agile methods to help you create high performance teams. And the icon on that hex is an engine. So we sometimes talk about high performance engines as teams. And then, as I said earlier, you need to be able to layer in agile ideas for how to be agile in security and data management, release management, et cetera. And that's, that's modern DevOps. Your approach to DevOps, and if you're, I think my video is on, I'm like waving my arms around this, there's different sort of continuum of DevOps. If you're in a highly regulated organization, then your approach to release management might be more formal. You might have to maybe use something called ITIL as a framework for managing your releases. You have to go through a certain process before you, because you're protecting um, 
your stakeholders and you have to deliver in a very rigorous way. So that might be your reality because pragmatism, that might be the way you have to do DevOps. But I would tell you, even in that structured way, there's a way to become very agile, even using these traditional release management approaches. Um, so try to be as agile as you can in the situation you find. But in, in a more modern, in the other area, the other uh, end of the continuum of DevOps is where you've got an Amazon developer that can write their own code and put it into production themselves. And they can do that many times a day. So their way of doing um, DevOps at Agile might be completely different than if you're building software for a hospital. And this is the beauty of DA is that you can customize your approach to, for both of those situations. So that's DevOps. And the next layer out is the value stream. And now we start to think about, it's not just a particular application. It's not just about IT. There's end-to-end -end value. Value stream starts at the customer and usually ends at the customer. And an example I sometimes use is, one of my last engagements I, I was in before I joined PMI was I was the, the coach for Papa John's Pizza. And uh, I'm pretty sure you have it in India. I'm trying to remember last time I was in India, I believe I saw Papa John's in the, at the airport. But anyway, it's one of the largest pizza companies in America and they use Discipline Agile. And I was in there helping them. And I talked about value streams that when you order a pizza from your home, that's where the value stream starts. And then you might be on your mobile app and you order that pizza and then it goes off to the, the franchise and they have a system to receive it. And they probably have a point of sale system and a, a, a cooking system and, and, and then they make the pizza and then there's a driver involved and there's a system for that and tracking the driver. And then when the driver brings you your pizza, there's a payment. Maybe there's a payment to the mobile app or maybe there's a payment when they arrive at your door. But that end-to-end -end experience from the moment I say I want pizza and I order it on my mobile app to when it turns up at my door and I paid for it and start eating it, <laughs> that is what a value stream is. And so what I know it's a long story, but the, the idea here is we need to be agile throughout the entire value stream. And this is where you see the other hexes here. And, and there's agile guidance for each of these areas. And then at the outermost layer, we have digital agile for the enterprise. And while we're talking about finance and vendor management or procurement, uh, legal, top left, second from the top left, people management. You can call that HR or people operations. We've chosen to call it people management, at least for now. Um, but there, behind that process blade, you would have the ideas uh, from things like Jurgen Apello's Management 3.0, uh, Daniel Pink, how to met, how to how to uh, incent and motivate agile teams, um, how to do job descriptions for agile teams, how to compensate and structure agile teams. Um, so the, actually the, the structuring of agile teams is down in discipline agile delivery area, but all that HR kind of things is inside the people management process blade. So summary folks, this is the scope of DA. It started at discipline agile delivery and we expanded it to the entire enterprise. And this is the beautiful thing about DA that really does not have peer in the industry. There is no such a thing that has this scope of DA to help you be agile across the enterprise. I tell you a story when I'm when I'm coaching teams and they're trying to be the best that they can be and they're struggling to maybe meet the goals of their sprint or the iteration if they're using scrum uh, often the reason that they're struggling is not their fault it's because they're working with something somebody outside the team another area of the organization is not being agile themselves as an example it might be a PMO that says before you go into the next sprint I'm going to need a business case before I give you more funding from finance so spend two weeks doing a business case before I give you another three three months of funding. This is not agile, folks. There's a there's a different way to do things. Continuous funding approaches, lightweight business cases that can be far more agile. So in many cases, the impediments to agile are the hexes outside of the actual delivery. And the beautiful beautiful thing about DA is D, this one agile certified coaches know how to go in and have the discussions with pmos with finance to teach them new ways of working so that they can be more agile and then move away from being impediments to actually being enablers to the team's agility it's a beautiful thing this is how in, in whole enterprises become agile uh, and you learn about that through da and through its certifications something that we've done for years uh, prior to pmi so how can it help help me? There are three core value propositions of disciplined agile. 
And the first one should be fairly obvious. And it is, we need to raise the bar and raise the expectations of the skills that we have on, dis on, on agile teams. Like a, 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 a simple agile certification is often two days, sort of a guaranteed to pass test, no requirement for any experience. And then we can call ourselves a master. Folks, that doesn't make sense. And, and that's hurting us with our business because often we go into a project and we're like an agile project manager, scrum master, whatever you want to call it. And we don't have enough education and we're given a big investment and things don't go well. And then agile is blamed. It's not agile's fault is that we're not investing enough in the education. So I, I, uh, if you haven't seen the choose your wild book, let me just grab it. This, this is our body of knowledge. This, you know, compare this to the scrum guide that was 19 pages. I heard that it's now 13 pages. Um, this is 400 pages. Okay. This, this is the body of knowledge. Choose your wow. If you're a PMI member, you can download the PDF for free. Um, I like to carry the hard copy around, even though I wrote it, with Scott, <laughs> because I will carry it around from retrospective to retrospective working with the teams. And they say, you know what? We need to do something more than user stories. We need to, we need to model the application. We need to do some prototyping or something. Mark, how do we do this? And I say, well, let's turn to the Explore Scope Goal. And in there, we'll see different ways of supplementing our user stories with different types of modeling techniques. So my point here, folks, is that we need to invest in learning what those strategies are. That will make us all more effective. Um, and this should be, so PMI strives to have certifications on the agile perspective that equate to the rigor and credibility that they have on the traditional side. So if you've got a CAPM or a PMP uh, certification, which is very well respected on the traditional side, we now have the same thing now on the agile side. And believe me, the world is learning about DA because we have 300 chapters around the world and they're all curious about what discipline agile is about. And they go, wow, this is very comprehensive guidance. Our people should learn this. And as, D, as the world hears about DA, I believe, I already see it, that employers are starting to demand a better certification, more rigorous one. So the value proposition number one is learn more, you'll be more effective. It's an obvious value proposition. Better skilled teams yield better results. So a traditional agile method um, like Scrum, which is amazing, teaches you, teaches you how to fish and feeds you for a day. But, but once you get beyond that method, how do you get better? Well, with the DA toolkit, we teach you how to fish. So we feed you for life. And you can, regardless of your situation, you can customize Agile for you. The DA toolkit number two, value proposition number two, is that we provide guidance that goes beyond IT, goes beyond the teams to the entire organization. And then third, um, with the acquisition of Flex, we provide guidance for Agile at scale. So if you're using this thing called SAFE or large scale Agile, we can help you get better by cherry picking ideas from the toolkit, combining it with the guidance from Flex, and you become much more effective at safe. Yeah. So those are the three, three value props. Time check here. Um, now, uh, this is an example of a case study. Barclays has 1,200 Agile teams, not people, but teams, 1,200 teams around the world, and it's probably more by now, um, that use DA. Now, they don't self-identify as DA, because they might be doing Scrum, they might be doing Lean, they might be doing less, save something else. But underneath the covers, they're using the techniques from the toolkit. And for instance, one of the things that they've decided to use is a role called an architecture owner. Think of it as a technical lead. All the teams around the world have an architecture owner. Why? Because that makes sure that all the teams are following that enterprise architecture guidance, regardless of what flavor of Agile they use. So this is what Barclays has done, and, and they have given the teams the freedom to use the method that makes sense for them, but use some of the core concepts from the DA toolkit along the way. I'm going to take a deeper dive into the delivery aspect of disciplined agile. And uh, you have to pick up the pace a little bit, so I'm not going to read all the details of this slide, but suffice it to say that it's more, the agile is more than working software. It's about consumable solutions, solutions that are easy to use, easy to maintain, that, that our customers are delighted by. And I'm gonna take you, deep, take you into a deeper dive into what's behind this hex 
just one agile delivery, what's behind it? Well, first of all, we need to give the teams the ability to choose their own life cycle. That, um, and what that means is think of a life cycle as a, as a method or a, a starter recipe. Remember I talked about ingredients? Well, where do you start? Well, you start by picking a particular life cycle or recipe, and that might be Scrum, it might be Lean, it might be this thing called exploratory, which is similar to a, a Lean startup approach. Uh, the Agile life cycle is based upon Scrum. So if you've seen a Scrum diagram before, you'll recognize the Scrum diagram in the circle here called Agile. Why don't we call it Scrum? Well, because it's more than Scrum. It's It's got the practices of Scrum, but it's also got some ideas around technical ideas around testing and pair programming and other, other ideas. It's got ideas around Agile data and Agile modeling. Collectively, that's all Agile. So that's why we didn't call it the Scrum life cycle. But the characteristic about this life cycle is that it's based on Scrum. And therefore, it has time boxes, what Scrum calls sprints, what we like to call iterations. You can call it whichever, it doesn't matter. But that is the characteristic of this life cycle is it's got these time boxes called sprints. Okay? Um, and that's one, that's one way of working. That's one, one recipe. And we also have a lean approach. And the difference about lean is it does not have these time boxes. You pull work through your system as you've got the capacity to deliver it. And you're not constrained by these time boxes. You, you don't stop and plan two weeks of work and then stop and have a retrospective and have a demo and then do it again over and over and over again, which is what you do with Scrum. Lean, it's more of a continuous flow approach. The top two life cycles here are also uh, the, the Agile and the Lean. These are more project-based life cycles. So if, if you're using the la Agile life, life cycle using which Scrum behind it, you might go through a number of sprints, a number of iterations before you have enough functionality to actually deliver something. Then you deliver it and the project is done. That's a project-based approach using Agile. And we have the similar project-based approach using Lean, where it might be a six-month project, but I'm pulling work, I'm not using iterations, and then I complete the project, deliver it, and move on. So there's a project-based approach, but there's also a product-based approach. You may hear a lot of people talking about from project to product. The big, a lot of fanfare around it. In fact, I have the book right here from Project to Product, a very good book. By Mick Kirsten, he's a friend of mine. Um, but not everything's a product. Okay, so don't don't think why it should be the Product Management Institute. No, there's still still a need for projects. We need both. The, the life cycles at the bottom here: continuous delivery agile and continuous delivery lean are more product based, where you go from release to release. And in the continuous delivery of agile, you actually release every two weeks, right? Every release a feature every couple of weeks, and that's why you see a little conveyor belt. On, uh, on that particular diagram. So we have different flavors, folks. And the program is where you have teams of teams, lots of teams delivering something. This is a safe, like approach. So uh, digging underneath these life cycles, um, because I still got a bit to cover, I can't spend too much time on these. But if you know Scrum, you'll recognize the bit in the middle. It, 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 and that you'll, uh, it looks like Scrum. But there's more to an enterprise delivery using Scrum than just the little bit that Scrum teaches you. Where does your backlog of requirements come from? So you've got stuff up front, and we have an inception phase for that. If I've got a six-month project, pragmatism says that my, my, my boss isn't going to give me funding for six months unless I kind of tell him what I'm going to deliver. That forces us to do a little bit more requirements and planning before we jump into that first sprint, that first iteration, and start to build stuff. So we have an inception phase for that. Um, and that might be a week, two weeks, a month. It might be a couple of days, what context counts. But we do have a phase for it. And then we have a construction phase where you go through a number of iterations or sprints to, to build out the functionality. And then we have a transition phase to actually deliver it. If you, Folks, if you don't need the phases, don't use them. So a lot of people get looked at, look at this diagram and go, I don't like DAD because I don't like DA because it looks kind of like waterfall or something with all these phases. Um, this is a project-based approach. Remember what I was told you before, if you need to spend some time planning the project out before you jump in, that's okay. <laughs> don't be, don't be apologize for that. Pragmatism. But if you don't need to do that, if you can, if your boss is just going to give you money and you start the project and jump into the first sprint, then great. Don't use this life cycle. Use the, the continuous delivery agile life cycle and you don't have an exception. So you don't have to, all of this is optional, but it's, we find people like to use this. 
underneath the phases, you'll see various milestones. So the um, governance, lean governance is built right into DA. It's one of the reasons organizations who learn about DA love it because they don't have to figure out governance. It's, it's right there. You've got milestones. You can actually add your additional milestones if that makes sense for you. For instance, I see some organizations add a milestone for a security um, audit to make sure that there's no holes in the architecture, no vulnerabilities. So they actually have a formal review of the architecture. So you, you can customize this guidance. Okay, so that's the agile life cycle. Uh, the lean one, this is the project-based lean life cycle where as example, six months, same idea, you have an inception, a construction, but you don't have iterations. You don't have sprints and you organize your work a little bit differently. You, in this case, you might organize it into what we call pools by business value, stuff that needs to be expedited, stuff that needs to be done by a certain delivery date. Um, and, and all of this is customizable, but th th so this is a lean life cycle project based. And then the continuous delivery life cycle, notice there's no inception and there's no transition. This is the Amazon model where I'm pulling something, I'm working on it, I'm delivering it, boom. I pull something else, I work on it, I deliver it, boom. So we have choice, different life cycles. Governance is baked in. I talked about the governance already, so I'm gonna move on. Um, now the content is organized into goals so you can easily find it. For instance, when you form a team, I check here, um, you're gonna need to decide how big is the team? What skills do they need? Where is it gonna come from? Is it full-time employees? Is it consultants? Are they working full-time on this project or across, across multiple projects? Are they co-located? Are they distributed? Um, East-West distribution, North-South distribution. You get the idea, lots of decisions. And what we have in the toolkit is guidance for the different op options you have and the pros and cons of different approaches. So I'm gonna show you one for specifically. Explore scope. Agile teaches us to use user stories, and that's wonderful. A sentence or two to describe a feature, um, a few more sentences to describe um, what acceptance criteria or how to test it, how to make sure that it's done. But folks, that, that's like a page or less about a feature. If you're building sophisticated software, clearly that's not enough. So you need to supplement your user stories with other models. And what are your choices? Well, behind the explore scope goal, you have these choices. And, and you don't, you, you have, please, you do not do all these, <laughs> but they're there as a reference to say, mm, I wanna learn more about usage. It's second second uh, purple box called, these are called decision points, explore usage. Mm, how do I create a better user experience beyond this text of user stories? How do I understand my users better so I can create a better uh, application? Well, you know what? There's this thing in there, in there called personas. And what you're seeing here, folks, is a snapshot from the Choose Your Wow book, where we dis we de define each of your alternatives, reference to where you can find out more information, and then define where it might be useful for you, trade-offs. So you can decide, you can cherry pick which of these you like to help you be more effective when you choose your way of working. The options that are bold italicized means that if you're, if you're doing one of them within a particular group, these ones are good places to start, sort of default choices. And the selections that have an arrow beside it say that generally that's an ordered list and that generally the ones at the top of the list are more agile and better than the ones at the bottom of the list. I say generally because context counts, but this helps you make better decisions about which techniques to use. It's very rich. So producing value, really important for you to understand that success doesn't come from just adopting a method and saying, yeah, I'm agile now. So Scrum or Safe or Spotify or Less or whatever you choose as a method is great. It's great, don't get me wrong. That's a starter recipe though. Successful organizations recognize they need to take responsibility for evolving their own agility. So if you heard about Spotify, the Swedish music company, and people, they've figured out a way to do agile and there's YouTube videos about it. People have copied their approach and they say, we use the Spotify model. Our teams are called squads and our COPs are called guilds and they have chapters and tribes and things. It's, it's really interesting and fun technology or terminology. But folks, unless you're a Swedish online music company, that's not good enough for you. And by the way, they did that seven or eight years ago. They moved on to do something else. The beautiful thing about Spotify is that they took responsibility for evolving a way of working that makes sense for them. And this is what you need to do as well. And the Choose Your Wow book, DA can help you do that. You can become a Spotify. And that's how you win, folks. You don't win and, and beat your competitors by copying some canned approach off the shelf. If that's safe, 
If it's Scrum, that's great, but that's not the destination. That's the beginning. So process improvement. Let's talk about this, and then I'll be winding up, and we'll take take a few questions. Um, process improvement. Let's say you're doing Scrum, and we have this thing called the retrospective at the end of every iteration or sprint. And um, we say, did we deliver what we said we were going to deliver? If not, what were the problems? Maybe you said, thought you were going to do five features and you only deliver four. So this team says, ah, we didn't meet our commitment. Um, business is not happy. How can we get better? So we identify the problem. And they say, how do we get better? What can we possibly do? This is what we do in a retrospective. And usually it's the scrum master that's telling us, oh, well, we're going to try this, we're going to try that. It's called a process experiment. Or maybe you have an agile coach that comes in and says, in my experience, try this or try that. Um, and that's a, that's a process experiment. And many times because they don't know enough, remember my value proposition number one, we need better skilled teams. Because they don't even know the different ways to explore scope that I just showed you, they pick something that's not appropriate. It doesn't make sense. And, and, and that's failing fast. And failing fast is a good idea in that if we're going to fail let's fail early so we can learn and get better and the sooner we get better the sooner we get better results failing fast is a good idea but it can be time consuming and expensive as we try to figure out the best approach the best way of working can we get better well we can get better if we identify the right fixes the right process experiments that make sense for us folks i know we're unique we have unique contexts and unique teams and organizations and things but many of the situations you find it yourself in have been done before. There are proven techniques, and that's why it's context-specific advice in the DA toolkit. Um, a coach can help you, but they're very expensive and hard to find. And here's a here's thing I'd like you to think about. Rather than relying on a scrum master or an agile coach to have all the answers for you, what if all the team invested some time to learn the potential solutions, to learn what's in the toolkit? Now you've got a team full of coaches and you're gonna have much more effective retrospective discussions when somebody goes, oh, remember we learned about personas in the DA course? Let's try that, that makes sense. And everybody goes, oh yeah, right? So that's how you get more effective. That's the value of the DA toolkit. And on the right-hand side, folks here, we go from classic guide or continuous improvement, often called a Kaizen loop, by the way. And we call this, guided continuous improvement because we provide you guidance to make better decisions, GCI, the fundamental part of discipline agile. So it's a traditional method, you get better over time until you exhaust all the advice that the method gives you. And in the case of Scrum, it's not very much advice, right? Um, so how this is what happens to teams, they level off. Well, by doing continuous improvement, Kaizen, you will continue to improve. You'll figure out new ways of working and you'll get better over time. But our value proposition with DA is that with guided continuous improvement, you can accelerate that learning journey and you can get much better. So, so the core message here is start where you are, do the best that you can in the situation that you face and always strive to get better. Folks, it's really important you understand, as I said at the beginning of this talk, it's not DA or Scrum or DA or, or Spotify or DA or Safe or DA or traditional. It, makes you better no matter what you're doing. This is the beautiful thing about the toolkit. And as organizations realize this, it doesn't matter what you currently do, this is how you get better. And it's not disruptive. You don't throw it all, throw it all the good stuff you're doing. You build on whatever, wherever you are right now. So moving forward, this is the new certification journey. And um, you know that we spent the last year within PMI PMI is kind of being digesting discipline agile and integrating it and deciding what do we do with the ACP program and all that. And we came out of the gate with something called a, a DA, Lean Scrum Master certification. But we looked at that and it was kind of confusing the way it fit in with our existing certifications. We said, you know what, let's stop. Let's go back and, and relook at this. And the certification team did some research and they talked to hiring managers and they came out with this new journey. And I think that this is beautiful and rock solid. So first point, ACP is not going away. Okay? It's a great certification. It's very comprehensive. You have to learn a lot. It's a hard test. You need experience. It's a very credible certification. But you know what? It hasn't gotten the traction that you might expect. There are 35,000 certificate holders, but there are a million PMPs. So why haven't we gotten the same traction with the ACP? 
I mean, we think one of the reasons we know, because we've done some research, one of the reasons is that ACP isn't attached to a job role. So P employers don't see that the Agile certification, whether I'm a BA, a tester, a developer, a project manager, they don't correlate the ACP to better. So it doesn't get you more money. It doesn't get you more as, as effectively as it could opportunities. So what, so, but we don't want to mess with the ACP because it's a good certification and there's a lot of, lot of certificate holders, but we want to give people something more. So we have an entry level cert now called the DA Scrum Master. It is like the certified Scrum Master, the CSM, but much better, much more comprehensive. It, it not only covers uh, Scrum, it covers Lean and it covers the toolkit, what's in it. And now it's more, it's an introduction to the toolkit, teaches you how to find stuff in it, how to use it, and choose your way of working. But this, we think, is the best in class Scrum certification now. I'm so proud of it. Um, I didn't create the materials. We have a learning team to do it. And I, but I've seen the materials. They're great materials. There's videos, very professional. There's interactive exercises. It can all be done virtually. And if this is live, courses are, are, are now, be, now available. So this is the place to start with Agile. And then the senior Scrum Master, if you're an ACP, the next place to go would be the senior Scrum Master. And, and this is a, a, takes the Scrum Master to the next level, teaches about leadership, teaches about leading multiple teams, not just one, and um, it's sort of introductory coaching, how to go out into the different parts of the organization to help them be agile. Um, best in class, senior Scrum Master certification. There really is nothing like it out there. And folks, the PM, I, I, I'm going to be wrapping up right away. I, I know I'm running out of time. PM, one of the great things about PMI is we know that if you do traditional project management, PMPs make more money, get better job opportunities, have better opportunity for growth. Um, we now have the same thing on the Agile side. So if you're a Scrum Master and you want growth, you can now have a senior Scrum Master cert. And we have done research into market. We, we interviewed hiring managers around the world and asked them what they're looking for. And they said, well, we've got scrum masters, but we, we're looking for senior scrum masters. We're looking for experienced scrum masters. And now you have it. There's a cert for it. So you'd be proud to put that on your LinkedIn profile. In fact, I just discovered one here in Calgary. Somebody was looking for a senior scrum master. That's exactly what the title was. And I looked down at the, what they were looking for. And it was really interesting. They wanted people who understood Scrum and Lean and Disciplined Agile, which was really cool. Uh, and they didn't say safe. So um, the huge market for this. This is going to make you more valuable in your career. And then, and that's available next month, coming out December 4th, will be released. And then in Q1, we're releasing an updated, we have always had a coaching cert, but we're taking it to the next level. We're redoing it. It's going to be, the, an enterprise class coaching cert comes out in the first quarter and also a value stream consultant cert. So the purple ones are advanced certifications. The value stream consulting is the how do you improve safe, large scale, agile um, certification also coming out first quarter. So this gives you a place to grow, uh, uh, folks. I'm really excited about the new journey. Um, in in the, upper, the, the, the scope of DA, some of these hexes near the top, the process blades, we don't have content for yet. We do in some areas, like we've got content in people management, but we have nothing in legal. I'm talking about futures now. We intend to partner with organizations to create content and micro certifications around these things. So marketing is an example. You'll see an agile marketing specialist where you can take the foundational agile stuff and then take one or two days about how to do agile marketing and collectively get accreditation for that. So this is, this is the exciting future. Um, not there yet. We'll be building that stuff out over the next couple of years. And then um, this is the flex diagram. It talks about flow. If you've seen safe, it's very much hierarchical portfolio program teams. Um, we take that and sort of turn it on its side and using Al Shalloway's guidance from flex, we help you improve your safe implementations and flow value more uh, quick, quickly. So I don't have time to go into the details of this, but the course is coming out in this in Q1. So in summary, success doesn't come from adopting a prescriptive framework or methodology such as Scrum or Safe, but it's a great place to start. Okay, nothing wrong with these things, but it's only a beginning. For true business agility, we need to choose our own agile way of working, optimizing for our unique situation. 
DA is a rich, comprehensive, well-organized toolkit of strategies to help your organization be more successful with Agile. It brings a disciplined, agnostic, professional, enterprise approach to Agile, which is quite frankly what our industry has been lacking in the past. And finally, understanding what your options are, which ones work in different contexts leads to better decisions. Better decisions leads to better outcomes. You'll find more information. Um, we are adding more and more content to the PMI website all the time. We're in the process of migrating the Discipline Agile websites into PMI. If you're looking for tra training, um, just Google Discipline Agile training. <laughs> That's a quick way to find it. Or go to disciplineagileconsortium.org slash DA training. I, I believe your facilitators have a copy of my presentation and you're quite welcome to distribute it uh, to find more information. And just a reminder, the book is in PDF form, is free to PMI members, um, or you can get it on Amazon and, uh, and other places. So that's it for me. I'm on Twitter if you're interested in, in, in that kind of thing. And um, ha happy to take a few questions if you've got time. Yeah, uh, we have very interesting questions. But first of all, I would like to say uh, thank you, Pat, for like giving this presentation at so early in the morning. So uh, we have four interesting questions over here. So as we are the last session, so I, I would take all the questions. So I would read out to you, Mark, or do you want to read by yourself? Please do, please do. If, if you could facilitate, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah. Do you want to read the questions to me? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll read it out. That's better. Okay. So suppose the scenario uh, comprises a very large conglomerate uh, whose senior mid-level managers understand the value of agile leadership, but see no effective collaboration between CXOs. They love their CXOs. How would you advise these middle management seniors to present the case for CXOs adopting agility and radical collaboration? So hmm. it's a strategic question, I see. Yeah, yeah. So, um, one thing I would say is that um, there, we wrote another book called the um, Discipline Agile for for Executives, and it's a shorter book. And and, and we off, that's one of the things we often do is give that book to executives because it explains why it's important to choose your way of working. And so, so the education is at the team level, but also have, has to happen top down for executives as well. And what I often say to them is, who do you fear and who do you respect as companies? And what you often hear them talk about is for banks, it's the FinTech companies. It's the companies that don't have brick and mortar who are much more agile. Um, it's the FANG stocks, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Netflix, the Googles, uh, the Spotify's. And you know what's unique about the FANG stocks? They don't use SAFE. Okay, now they may, I've never encountered it. So don't quote me on it, but I pretty, pretty much guarantee you, I have been into these companies and I haven't seen safe anywhere. Why? Because they're smart people. They figure out ways of working that make sense for them. So if you understand that to be competitive and to be in, in, in business for years, you better figure this out and take responsibility for your own way of working. And then they're gonna, so that's the first thing. Can, can, <laughs> the, the executives are scared about these other companies and they go, you know what, you're right. So then what do we do? We don't know how to make our own way of working. Ah, well then train your teams and then you can become a Spotify, but you need to train them. Um, so that's what I would do. You got to sell, you got to sell the idea to the CXOs that, that this is important. That basically every team, every company out there is an IT company, whether they admit it or not. If you look at an Uber, what's their specialty? Driving people around in cars? No, it's the technology. The UPS, FedEx, it's the technology. Papa John's Pizza, they have amazing technology now. So how do, and how do we get good at that? Because that is that nowadays, that is the differentiator. Uh, well, you need to choose your way of working. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, so, so I hope you got your answer, uh, Mr. Cameron Hockey. So the next one is from Mohammad Jarir Mohawk. Hi, Mark. Do you think any project, irrespective of the underlying technology and the related industry, especially run via traditional waterfall methods, can be run under the discipline agile model, apart from typical IT ones? If so, 
if you can outline a bit. Sure. So the discipline agile can go far beyond IT. Um, so there's different, two different aspects of this. One is functionally into functional areas of the organization. So as I said, you can go into marketing, you can go into procurement, HR, and absolutely, and I've done this, of course, help them to be agile as well. So outside of IT, you can use a discipline agile. In traditional projects, um, yes, you can use a blend of the approaches too. If you're in a construction project or an infrastructure project, there is nothing wrong. Don't let anybody tell you different. There's nothing wrong with using a traditional approach with a classic work breakdown structure if it's a predictable project. You've done it before, the uncertainties are few, then you don't have to force everything into an agile approach. But you can still layer in agile ideas like daily stand-up meetings, um, visualizing your work with Kanban boards. So, and I've seen this on in, in Canada, we are re restoring our parliament buildings and they're using a traditional approach to manage this multi-billion dollar project. Um, they have a pro program, they have um, dozens of project managers using by and large traditional approaches, but they have daily stand-up meetings and they have scrums of scrums and they have big Kanban boards with sticky notes all over it. So it's not one or the other, you can blend the approaches in non-IT situations. Yeah, because construction project is very much like water for projects, no doubt about that. Yeah. But if you have yeah. the, IT, the mindset, then something can be actually altered with agility. A lot of exactly things. Exactly right. Yeah, yes. so what differentiates, uh, DAD, the next question from Mohammed Enamul Haq. So what differentiates uh, DAD from that, uh, from other methods? Um, so, so remember my slide we talked about the umbrella? So we are the, you can think of it as the Wikipedia of Agile. All the hundreds of practices are in disciplined Agile. How you assemble those practices into a method in the order in which you do things, that's what a method is. So, um, and, and remember I said, every method is incomplete. It talks about a piece of the puzzle and you have to assemble yourself different, a, a mashup of different methods to try to figure things out. And, and because I'm a process geek, <laughs> I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, so I've got that information up here, but most people who are fairly new to it don't. So you don't have to wait for 30 years to get the experience that I have. You can study it now in the toolkit and use it to customize any, any method that you currently use, DA makes you better. That's the bottom line. So, uh, the last question. What project management software do you uh, prefer, along with mindset, to implement DIA discipline in organization? Mm, Any... That's a great question. <laughs> yeah, it sounds to me like a tools question. Um, I got to be honest with you, not Microsoft Project. <laughs> uh, I mean, if, if you're in the previous example I just talked about, and you're doing a traditional work breakdown structure, then maybe. But um, I haven't used Microsoft Project for years. The only time I've used it is to do a very high level Gantt chart where people, I have the inception phase and then I have a, a little bar for every sprint um, with dates on it and the milestones. And, and it print, gets printed off on one piece of paper because the executive would love to see that as the overall project timeline. But I do not have a detailed work breakdown structure underneath it, just to be clear. <laughs> But so, th but there's lots of tools out there. I've used um, Jira over the years. Uh, Lean Kit is a very uh, a beautiful tool. I love Lean Kit. Um, but it's it's um, what else? Uh, um, uh, people have used uh, Trello. I mean, there's there, it depends on how sophisticated the projects are. And but I I prefer to use manual if possible. But but these I, I would say the most the one I've seen the most is Jira, but it's also not, not, uh, I don't know how to say this nicely. It's not my perfect, it's not my preferred tool. It's the most popular, but not my preferred tool. So I'm, I try to be agnostic about that. Pretty much anything works. Yeah. So actually, tools actually a bit, a bit customized, like whoever prefers to operate it. So it's better, like individual choice. But actually, yeah, uh, yeah Microsoft uh, project can work. So, oh, and TFS, of course. Uh, you know, don't forget about Microsoft's, um, or do, do, you, do you still call it TFS? But, but Microsoft's suite of tools is pretty good too. 
So uh, I think uh, probably now, Rosa, we have answered your question. So these were all these questions so far. So thank you so much, Mark, for your insights on uh, discipline at child. And I'm actually assuring the audience that we surely uh, get back to them with more discipline agile information from PMI Bangladesh chapter. We are also learning at our red, so we'll get back to them uh, pretty soon. Okay. So thank you so much, well, thank Mark. You. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. Um, please be safe out there. Take care. And when COVID is over, hopefully I can come see you all. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.